Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. We are hitting the pause button this week on our Reporter Roundtable to bring you a real-life experiment. And you have a front row seat. Are you ready? This week, we are taking you to court. The spotlight is on reopening schools, but what about our courts? Since the pandemic began, there's been almost no jury trials anywhere in the country. Now area courts are worried how they'll ever get 12 people to sit next to each other again. It is probably one of the biggest challenges ever faced by our judicial system. Jury trials are going to be different. That's Thomas Kelly Ryan, chief judge in Johnson County. He's the one who contacted us to ask for our help. Now, we don't get calls from judges very often, so he certainly got our attention. Judge Ryan wants to know, what would it take to bring you back into the courtroom? Would you serve on a jury in the middle of a pandemic? I talked to 10 other people, and none of them felt comfortable serving on a jury. That's Charles, and he's one of 12 people who received an official jury summons to join us on this video call to better understand what you think. We had no say on who was chosen. These citizens were picked just like a regular jury with the help of the Johnson County District Court and the Johnson County Bar Association. I would definitely want temperature check of people coming in the courthouse. This half hour, we asked what will it take to restart justice? And what about those who have been charged with crimes? They are sitting in jail. We've got to take care that individuals who are simply charged with a crime, that they are not unconstitutionally punished because we have been ineffective in dealing with the pandemic. As the coronavirus appends every institution and industry, stay with us as we track the unique and unprecedented challenges now facing our court system. Is justice deferred? Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marlies Gorley, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Though by a show of hands, if you received a jury notice through the mail today, how many of you would head over to the courthouse and report for jury duty, no questions asked? James, you didn't put up your hand. I'd want, I'd want to be assured there were uh, protocols in place uh, so we'd be safe. Exactly what James had said. I would want the reassurances from the courthouse. Precautions have been taken to you know, help us avoid contracting the virus. I would head over to the courthouse. I figure by now, measures should be in place. In preparation for this, I, I talked to... 10 other people that are over 70, I'm over 70, and none of them felt comfortable going in and serving on a jury. I just simply probably would have called first. I've never been on a jury, so I I guess I didn't know, I wouldn't know what to expect or, you know, we're, do you need to come with a mask? Do you get provided a mask? You know, so I would have probably just called just to make sure I wasn't screwing anything up. Tonya, did you have a different objection or are they similar to the ones we've already heard? concerned about safety and um, so would have a lot of questions before I would want to report for sure. We're going to show you the precautions and new safeguards your court is now taking in light of this pandemic. Watch and we'll be back to get your views in just a moment. Here we are at the front of the Johnson County Courthouse. Let's walk up the stairs to go in. In the vestibule, you'll queue up, socially distance to go through security. The good point is, we won't have the usual 300 people coming out for a trial. You'll have to empty your pockets to make sure that they go through the screen for security. And we're ready to go check in. You'll have your summons ready to go and bring it up to the window. No exchange of paper or touching any items. You just have to verify who you are and that's your summons and they will be directed to the courtroom for you to be assigned. After you've checked in, you'll go to your assigned seat in the courtroom. If you've served on a jury before, you might recognize this area as the jury box and the well of the court. This is where people are usually seated for selection of the jury. And usually they're seated right next to each other, row after row after row. As you can see here, the numbers indicate where potential jurors will be seated for this process. 
You'll notice that the jurors, potential jurors, are seated throughout the courtroom, not only here in front of the bar, but also back here in the gallery. And for Vore Dyer, it will be on both sides of the courtroom, again, socially distanced from each other. When we're ready to start the trial, the judge will walk in from their chambers and come up to the bench. On my left side is where the witnesses will testify from. They not only have the plexiglass between the witness stand and the judge, since it's closer than six feet, but also in front of them, because that protects our court reporter seated down here in front and any other persons, including the jury, seated out in the courtroom. When the case is concluded and given to the jury for deliberations, the courtroom will be sealed and this becomes the jury room. Jury trials are going to be different. There is no question about that. It's not going to be easy and it's definitely not going to be at the same pace it was before. But with everyone's patience and understanding, including the judge, we are able to do it safely and having your cooperation helps in the jury trial process to keep our system working. Does that make you feel better about the same or worse than you did before? I feel better, uh, but I probably wouldn't feel good enough to want to come back or want to do it. I think one of my concerns is the amount of time in a room. Um, the longer that there is a high volume of people in a relatively contained space, the higher chance that you have um, for contraction, even when everyone is wearing a mask. Yeah, that's a great question. How, how long are jury trials normally anyway, Judge Ryan? An average trial is either a day or two. Uh, there are occasions when they go three or longer. And ordinarily, in past times, we'd go for an hour and a half and then take a break, usually one break in the morning, one in the afternoon. We're going to be taking multiple breaks yeah. to break up the time, just simply the time frame when people are in the courtroom together. Brooke mentioned the masks. Are, is everyone in the courtroom wearing a mask? Everybody. Okay. Everyone. No, I thought, though, a witness, for instance, may not be required to wear a mask because the judicial system requires that the uh, accuser gets to see the face of the person accusing them, right? Right. Right. And attorneys want to see facial expressions, reactions, everything about that person when they're testifying. We are getting the clear plastic shields to be able to see their entire face or a mask that is not opaque. It's a transparent mask so that you'll be able to see their entire face. Who else had objections or saw some? Yes, James. Um, at the front door, at the very entrance. It looks like you had potential for a long line backing up there. What we are going to use, though, is an app called Wait While. It's very similar to when you go to the restaurant, you make your reservation and say, you can't have a table until 745. We'll text you when your table's ready. That way, we are going to have reduced numbers of people and having them called in in stages. Does that make you feel better, James? Better. I've been rained on and snowed on when <laughs> I couldn't get through the security gate. Yes. Uh, Katie, you had a different objection. Um, I would be more comfortable if there were symptom checkers and temperature checks. The county doesn't currently have the funding in place to do uh, temperature checks as you go into the courthouse for every single person. I would definitely want temperature check of people coming in the courthouse, What's jurors that? as well as other guests. Let's go back to the issue of masks, and this is back to a point that Brooke was making. Can you wear a mask for a full hour? How long can you wear a mask for? Two hours, three hours? Well, I work in healthcare, so 12 or 13 hours is the longest I've worn one so far. Yeah, I, I, I work in a hotel, and uh, I have to wear a mask all day. And I'll tell you, it, it is exhausting. I, I, my hat's off to the medical workers. Uh, it is hard. And I and there's occasions, you know, five or 10 minutes where I have to take the mask off just to take a break. I would like to know, would you have the opportunity to kind of just uh, take a uh, breath and remove, not totally remove it, but pull it out so you can get some air? My concern is uh, for me who takes medication, just wearing a mask, if I'm going on errands to you know, in any given business, um, it gets a little uncomfortable and difficulty breathing becomes uh, 
it increases. How long can you keep your mask on for then without feeling you have to take it off? I've walked around for about 45 minutes. Uh, I don't know about sitting all morning, though, with it, unless I have a break. Masks, as we mentioned, are going to be mandatory, but would you prefer to wear a clear face covering or a face shield instead of a mask? I bet a face shield is cooler. The face shields, they're not comfortable. I mean, and the, the one thing I was going to say from the video earlier was, if you're wearing a face shield or even a mask or both, it is really difficult to hear people. Um, even in the same room, people talking in a normal voice or a little louder, it's really difficult to hear them. So I kind of, one of the things I saw in that video was there were jurors way towards the back maybe, it will be really difficult if there's no sound system or, or microphones or whatever. So that was just the only other thing I was thinking. I'm going to turn to the judge here. So a juror can't hear that. I mean, do they have the liberty to say, hey, judge, I can't hear you? Or Absolutely. They, they can shout that out at you? Yes. Raise their hand. <laughs> You're being empowered here. OK. <laughs> I wanted to ask, I've never served on a jury, so I'm not sure, and I'm sure they have thought about this, and that is handicapped. How do you handle that? Judge? Well, it depends on, obviously, the nature of their disability. Um, it may be that they can't serve currently if they can't wear a mask, because that's one of the, if someone has respiratory issues of all sorts of different types, and they can't, um, they can't really function without a mask on, we can't have them serve at this point. But as far as physically and mobility-wise, we have our courtrooms compliant with having space available for persons who can't climb the steps or if they're in a wheelchair or with a walker, uh, we're, we're able to accommodate that. The biggest difference in the video that I saw, and I was watching that for the first time too, was that uh, the jurors would not, at the end of a trial, go into a little room to deliberate, as you see on television. They, the whole courthouse now, the whole courtroom itself is now left to you to deliberate. Any concerns about that? I think it's, those things are obviously better done face to face uh, and maybe even in more close quarters. I think it'd be harder, harder to understand one another, harder to see facial inflections. And um, I, I just think it'd be more difficult um, but everything's more difficult here. Does the length of a jury trial impact your ability to serve? I think it's like, you know, maybe less about trial length and like Brooke was saying, just the time that we're held together. I think from a health concern, I would be more concerned about being together for like eight hours for, you know, for two days versus maybe two hours a day for a week. Brooke? We obviously have the technology to be face-to-face -face in a digital sense, such as the Zoom call, um, it, is it out of scope to ask if it's possible to conduct jury trials where we don't have to be in a room all at the same time and you could limit the amount of time um, by having part of it digital and then maybe coming together at the end or something? Uh, excellent point. Can I ask then the judge, I mean, could you have a Zoom trial? One distinction would be that it would have to be in a civil case as opposed to a criminal case. Why the distinction? In a criminal case, there is more constitutional rights attached to that because of the importance of uh, liberty, of whether or not you remain free or if, you're, uh, if you may face the consequences if convicted. You have the right to be present in the same room with the person who's accusing you, be the victim, or to hear other witnesses and for you to see all the witnesses and to see the juries, the jurors themselves. Um, there's just those protections that, yeah. that makes it really, I, I can't imagine being able to do a criminal trial. So even what Brooke is talking about, which is just components of it, not the whole thing, just some components of it, that wouldn't work in a criminal case? No, um, unless the parties agreed to it. And as, as attorneys have told me, what attorney is going to recommend to their client to agree to that? Could you potentially just do the jury deliberations via Zoom? Because one of the persons was talking about how seeing facial expressions and that kind of stuff. If we see all the evidence in the courtroom, but then when we do the deliberations, that allows us to kind of get some space and we can still see each other, we can hear each other, but uh, we don't necessarily need to be in the same room to deliberate and talk about the subject. So could that happen? It could. Again, in a, in a civil case, I think that's possible. It's interesting. 
And it's an interesting concept that I've never heard anybody talk about that end of the trial. We are, in our test cases that we were going to have in Johnson County on civil cases, we were going to conduct the jury selection at the very beginning by Zoom and then have the trial, have them report out to the courthouse and have the trial there. That's an interesting idea of, of being in the courtroom and then not having to be together to deliberate. There's, there's pros and cons to that. Jason, you could be totally changing the judicial justice system <laughs> by your comments, but you will take those comments, Absolutely. though, because Absolutely. this is not just an academic exercise. No, no. Uh, these thoughts are going to be taken and used by the court system to look at how we do restart trials, jury trials in this community. Exactly. Yeah. I want to be sensitive to your time. Did anybody else have any other objections, concerns that we wanted to make sure were passed on to the court system? How would you handle that if somebody were to test positive um, or, you know, you had a juror or somebody else, um, what would be the next steps? Because it seems like that people think a lot about how to avoid it, but not a lot about what to do if it happens. Does that shut down the entire trial because someone has tested positive for COVID-19? If someone were to test positive during the course of a trial, we would most likely just stop at that point, make that assessment, and not hesitate to call a mistrial and just we'd have to start over again, and, and but we'd definitely be looking at taking care of those people and getting them with the medical people for testing. For all of the sacrifice that jurors make in the service of the public and of the judicial system, what is the current pay that jurors get every day for coming into the courtroom and serving on a jury? $25 a day plus mileage. $25 plus mileage a day. And, and you're all still on board with a yes, we're going to come to serve on a jury? <laughs> you're not thinking of adding pay for hazard pay during this period hazard of time? Hazard pay, yeah. No, Need to up the money. <laughs> no, no hazard pay. <laughs> Thank you to our Zoom jury uh, for your service today. Do I have the power to say court is adjourned? Absolutely. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much for giving thoughtfully and candidly of your concerns about what would happen uh, if we try to bring back juries uh, to our community. A couple of questions I'd like to stay with you on. In Britain, for instance, they're looking at having smaller juries as a way of getting around the issues of having too many people in the courtroom, perhaps seven jurors. Has that been considered? Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, Arizona was one of the first states that uh, actually passed the law to reduce the number of um, strikes or challenges to pick a jury. So they would have a smaller jury. Again, only in civil cases, not in criminal cases, because the criminal right to a jury trial has some constitutional issues that you can't just overwrite with a statute. What happens if somebody just says, you know, I'm really concerned about my health, and so I refuse to come on a jury because uh, of COVID-19. Are people allowed to say that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, and people are concerned from our side, well, are they just using that as another excuse? We're taking into account all the health issues, uh, job issues. Yeah, you could have been unemployed or furloughed for three months with no pay, and now you're asking me right. to give up more time for just a few dollars a day? Right. Or I you have been working, and you need to keep working because you're not certain about your job. The other side of this, which we haven't talked about because we've been so focused on jurors, but I think about if we haven't had any jury trials here, um, what has that done to those defendants? I mean, have we got people now in our community who have been waiting indefinitely in jail cells throughout this entire pandemic, waiting for a jury trial to get going? And what's been happening to them? We have, as everyone else has. Um, those are the ones that are the highest concern. So when are you looking to resume trials at this point? We are now anticipating September 14th and September 21st for three limited trials each of those weeks. And if those work and jurors do respond and are comfortable, our hope is to start again with trials the week of October the 5th. If it really does, though, become almost impossible to get jurors to come together, to get 12 people to serve on a jury, we have an uptick in COVID cases. Is it possible to have judge-only trials? Absolutely. But that has to be, the parties have to agree to that. I can't impose that and say, we're going to have a trial and you don't have a chance for your jury. The Honorable Thomas Kelly Ryan is the chief judge in Johnson County. This has been interesting. Thanks for letting us be part of it. Thank you very much, Nick. We appreciate your help. 
Now, I mentioned it briefly with Judge Ryan, but if there are no jury trials, what's happening with those who have been accused? And what about the rest of our justice system during this pandemic? Checking in with us for answers on that are Ruth Patch, who leads Kansas City's Public Defender's Office. And from the other side of our state, Reggie Harris and Jasmine Sharma, who just co-wrote an in-depth article on the impact of COVID on the courts. Well, they both come to us from the Brian Cave Law Firm in St. Louis. Reggie is a former federal prosecutor who directed the U.S. Attorney's Civil Rights Program. Jasmine has represented indigent death row inmates and is on loan to the law firm as part of the Concordance Academy Fellowship Program. She provides free legal help to released prisoners. Ruth, if there haven't been any juries, first of all, what is happening to all of those people who have been accused of crimes? They are sitting in jail. So how many people are we talking about here? Jail holds about 800 people. It's they're sitting in jail. They're sitting. They're waiting, for so, the most part. So since these uh, stay-at-home orders went effect in in March, uh, Jasmine, we have people languishing in jail, just waiting indefinitely for their trials to begin. Yeah, Nick, I think your question actually goes to the heart of the criminal justice system, which is disparate treatment based on both wealth and race. Essentially, if you're able to afford bail, you're currently staying at home and able to quarantine. If you're not able to afford bail, you're currently trying to save off the coronavirus while you're waiting in prison. Well, I thought, though, Reggie, there was a concept called swift justice, that we, we shouldn't have to wait indefinitely uh, to be tried for our crimes, right? That is the hope, and, 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 and in theory, that has played out differently, and, you know, uh, depending on what jurisdiction you're in. And I think, you know, in my experience, the federal system moves a little, a lot quicker than, than, than most of the state systems. There was already these kind of uh, discrepancies or disparities in terms of how quickly a defendant can get justice depending on what system they're in. But if you add in this issue of COVID-19, then I think that compounds the issue that we have to look at in terms of Swift, this idea of swift justice. Ruth, since those shutdown orders began in March, have you gone to court at all as a public defender? Yes, yes. Well, court never stopped uh, for us as far as the preliminary matters, addressing bond, filing motions, um, and new people coming in. People are still being charged by the state and uh, coming in all the time. Do you have jury trials on the Missouri side? No, but our county does not. I mean, the... There was an administrative order that the Missouri Supreme Court sent out allowing judges in their jurisdictions to make those determinations. And in Jackson County, uh, our jury trials are suspended in, in the Independence Courthouse uh, until late September and downtown till early October. I'm assuming, though, Jasmine, that um, there is no appetite in Kansas City or, Missouri, or in St. Louis, for that matter, where we've had double-digit increases in homicides to release those who are waiting a trial at this moment in time for serious crimes? I know that there's been double-digit increases in homicides, but I think it's important to recognize and realize that, you know, decarceration doesn't necessarily lead to an uptick in homicides. And I think that that kind of causal, causal connection needs to be um, closely looked at. You know, under the law, those folks are only charged with the crime. They've not been adjudged guilty. Um, and, you know, our system has to, we've got to take care that individuals who are simply charged with a crime, that they are not indirectly, unfairly, and frankly, unconstitutionally punished because we have been, you know, somewhat ineffective in dealing with the pandemic. Most of us have been so focused on things like how do we get our children back to school, mask mandates, are we going to be closing down bars and restaurants again? What other aspects of this COVID crisis, this pandemic, uh, is occurring that is impacting the justice system that most of us are totally unaware of at this point? In Kansas City especially, we've had, you know, this call to bring in all kinds of... Um, federal resources and investigators. And we really don't hear about resources to protect the um, the rights of the people who are accused. And that's a real concern for me that there's all kinds of resources being brought in on the law enforcement side to prosecute defendants and uh, that the public defender system has received no bump and we're already overloaded. Jasmine? I think right now, especially in prison, you have, you know, some of my clients citing really grave concerns. They're, they're not being, their rights aren't being protected. There's a lot of constitutional violations at issue. But also, they're just scared. You know, they're scared. 
that they don't have protective equipment to fight off a pandemic. I know in my article I cited that prisons are essentially a petri dish for coronavirus, and I don't think that we've handled it. We ha we haven't handled providing the accused and even those who have all already been convicted. We haven't provided them the resources to um, get out of this safely. But when you have other areas from nursing homes and schools who are also complaining about a lack of resources, many people watching will say, why should we be spending those t that type of money and investment on prisons? They don't have the choice to leave and quarantine at home. They don't have the choice to go to the store and buy sanitizing equipment. So I think we need to take a special look at what's going on in prisons. And before the pandemic, I was able to go into prison and see my clients see the conditions of the prison, and now everything's just so uncertain. What other implications has this pandemic had on our court and justice system, Reggie? And we haven't even touched on the issue of, you know, the, the technical concerns um, about uh, trying to have a trial uh, or a hearing um, that has to be handled virtually as opposed to in person and what kind of an effect that might have on a person uh, who stands accused. Well, we had our judge on just a moment ago who talked about the, uh, the there couldn't be these virtual trials, that you had to be there in person, and in Johnson County, they have to be in person, but they'll be wearing masks. A lot of the body language of a trial takes place by watching people and seeing how they react to things. Is that compromised, Ruth, when uh, witnesses, uh, defendants, uh, attorneys and jurors are all wearing masks? It definitely is compromised uh, at a lot of levels. And even your effectiveness as a lawyer to communicate well while you're wearing a mask. The federal um, public defenders have tried cases and there's other public defenders in the state who've tried cases. And they've all talked about how even when you social distance and you set the you spread out the jury, you can't see their faces and you can't see how they're reacting to your questions. Jasmine? I can see how... The jury system itself is a very dehumanizing process for a defendant, and it just seems like adding in all of these measures such as masks, of course, you know, it's, it's necessary and vital for the health, but you can see how it just further dehumanizes them. I don't have a gavel, uh, but if I did, this is where I'd start pounding it repeatedly on the table from the Public Defender's Office in Kansas City, Ruth Patch, and zooming in from St. Louis attorneys Reggie Harris and Jasmine Sharma. Thanks for checking in with us. After this, I think I may have half the credit hours necessary to be called an attorney. Next week, our reporters return as we catch up on the most impactful news of our week. Until then, I'm Nick Haynes. From all of us here at Kansas City PBS, keep calm and carry on.